Spring again was a time of flowers, and water ran in the ravines and flowed down to the sea. Many birds came back to the island. Tainer and Lorai built a nest in the tree where they were born. They built it of dry seaweed and leaves, and also with hairs off Rantu's back. Whenever he was in the yard, while it was being made, they would swoop down if he was not looking, and snatch a beakful of fur and fly away. This he did not like, and he finally hid from them until the nest was finished. I had been right in giving a girl's name to Lorai, for she laid speckled eggs, and with some help from her mate, hatched two ugly fledglings which soon became beautiful. I made up names for them and clipped their wings, and before long they were as tame as their parents. I also found a young gull that had fallen from its nest to the beach below. Gulls make their nests high on the cliffs, in hollow places on the rocks. These places are usually small, and often I watched a young one teetering on the edge of the nest and wondered why it did not fall. They seldom did. This one, which was white with a yellow beak, was not badly hurt, but he had a broken leg. I took him back to the house and bound the bones together with two small sticks and sinew. For a while he did not try to walk. Then, because he was not old enough to fly, he began to hobble around the yard. With the young birds and the old ones, the white gull and Rantu, who was always trotting at my heels, the yard seemed a happy place. If only I had not remembered to talk. If only I had not wondered about my sister Ulape, where she was, and if the marks she had drawn upon her cheeks had proved magical. If they had, she was now married to Nanko and was the mother of many children. She would have smiled to see all of mine, which were so different from the ones I had always wished to have. Early that spring I started to gather abalones, and I gathered many, taking them to the headland to dry. I wanted to have a good supply ready for the if the Aliwits came again. One day, when I was on the reef filling my canoe, I saw a herd of otter in the kelp nearby. They were chasing each other, putting their heads through the kelp, and then going under and coming up again in a different place. It was like a game we used to play in the brush when there were children on the island. I looked for Manani, but each of them was like the other. I filled my canoe with abalones and paddled toward the shore, one of the otter following me. As I stopped, he dived and came up in front of me. He was far away, yet even then I knew who it was. I never thought that I would be able to tell him from the others, but I was so sure it was Manani that I held up one of the fish I had caught. Otter swim very fast, and before I could take a breath, he had snatched it from my hand. For two moons I did not see him again, and then one morning while I was fishing, he came suddenly out of the kelp. Behind him were two baby otter. They were about the size of puppies, and they moved along so slowly from that from time to time Manani had to urge them on. Sea otter cannot swim when they are first born, and they have to hold on to their mother. Little by little, she teaches her babies by brushing them away with her flippers, then swimming around them in circles until they learn to follow. Manani came close to the reef, and I threw a fish into the water. He did not snatch it as he usually did, but waited to see what the young otter would do. When they seemed more interested in me than in the food, and the fish started to swim away, he seized it with his sharp teeth and tossed it in front of them. I threw another fish into the water for Manani, but he did the same things as before. Still the babies would not take the food, and at last, tired of playing with it, swam over and began to nuzzle him. Only then did I know that Manani was their mother. Otter mate for life, and if the mother dies, the father will often raise the babies as best he can. This is what I thought had happened to Manani. I looked down at the little family swimming beside the reef. Manani, I said, I'm going to give you a new name. It is Wanani, which fits you because it means girl with the large eyes. The young otter grew fast and soon were taking fish from my hand, but Wanani liked abalones better. She would let the abalone I toss to her sink to the bottom and then dive and come up holding it against her body, with the rock held in her mouth. Then she would float on her back and put the abalone on her chest and strike it again and again with the rock until the shell was broken. She taught her young to do this 
and sometimes I sat on the reef all morning and watched the three of them pounding the hard shells against their chests. If all otters did not eat abalone this way, I would have thought it was a game played by Wanani just to please me. But they all did, and I always wondered about it, and I wonder to this time. After that summer, after being friends with Wanani and her young, I never killed another otter. I had an otter cape for my shoulders, which I used until it wore out, but never again did I make a new one. Nor did I ever kill another comorant for its beautiful feathers, though they have long, thin necks and make ugly sounds when they talk to each other. Nor did I kill seals for their sinews, using instead kelp to bind the things that, that needed it. Nor did I kill another wild dog, nor did I try to spear another sea elephant. Ulape would have laughed at me, and others would have laughed too, my father most of all. Yet this is the way I felt about the animals who had become my friends, and those who were not, but in time could be. If Ulape and my father had come back and laughed, and all the others had come back and laughed, still I would have felt the same way. For animals and birds are like people, too, though they do not talk the same or do the same things. Without them, the earth would be an unhappy place.'